So I'm going to talk about a little more in depth about these patterns of net primary productivity and precipitation that we see in both space and time. And I want to start kind of big picture here and just get you to think about uh, what, when we think about the land surface, what do, the, uh, what do those types of ecosystems look like that comprise the land surface? And around over 40% of the land surface is in fact what we would consider water limited dry land ecosystems. And these systems come in a diversity of forms and as a consequence, they support significant levels of biodiversity. Because these systems are so expansive, millions of people live within these dry land systems, their livelihoods are interwoven with the functioning and services that these ecosystems supply. So these ecosystems are socially, economically, and ecologically important. And what may be intuitive when we say water limited dry land ecosystems is that uh, water is in general what we think to be the primary limiting resources, resource driving the functioning of these systems. And so this is a graph from a classic paper by Isvaldo Sala where we see on the y-axis is mean primary production and on the x-axis is mean annual precipitation. Now, this is for the central US grassland and rangeland region. And as you can see, this relationship is uh, just ridiculously linear. Uh, and you, from this relationship, can predict almost over 90% of the variability in average productivity just with that single variable, mean primary production. So water is arguably the key limited resources, resource in these regions. Um, and from the slope of that relationship, the rise over run, from that line there, from a linear model, we can predict the spatial sensitivity of primary production in these regions. And just simply says the change in productivity per unit change in precipitation across space. And so each one of those points there, if you think about where it comes from, could be anywhere from 10 to 20 data points. So it reflects mean changes in productivity that arise from mean changes in precipitation that occur across space. And that's in part why this spatial model is so predictive and so linear. And I already said it, sorry, it's, we call this the spatial model. And this is one of the models we utilize to predict how ecosystems may respond to future changes in precipitation that we're expecting to see with climate change. And now I mentioned that these points may reflect 10 to 20 years of data. And so how do ecologists, how have we gone about producing that data? Well, as a field ecologist, uh, what I've done and what ecologists have before me have done is that they've gone out into the field and at the plot level, they've literally clipped biomass. And if you do this for 30 years, you will not only develop back problems, which may be my fate, but you can get a nice time series of productivity data. So on the y-axis there is net primary productivity, and on the x-axis there is uh, data from 1985 to 2016. So it's a 30-year time series at one location. And what we've done is we've paired that productivity data with weather data, typically annual precipitation. And when we integrate those two data sets, we can get an understanding of how sensitive net primary productivity is to year-to-year -year variation in precipitation. And the same way we did that for the spatial model, from the slope of that line, the rise over run, we can get an understanding of temporal sensitivity, which is just the sensitivity of primary productivity to fluctuations in precipitation at one location. And we call that the temporal model, okay? And so this sets up two 
relatively discreet models that ecologists have utilized to forecast how sensitive primary productivity is to changes in precipitation, the spatial model and the temporal model. And as you can see that the spatial model, the line there is far more steep than the temporal model. And what ecologists have, uh, have, ecologists have interpreted this as plant growth in general is more sensitive to changes in precipitation across space than through time. However, these data sets are fundamentally produced by, or these relationships are fundamentally produced by the same data. And ecologists have built these temporal models across these gradients of mean annual precipitation. And what we generally see is that as mean annual precipitation increases, the slope of the temporal model decreases. And we can plot this in another way. So this is a graph from a nature paper by Travis Huxman and Melinda Smith and colleagues where they related temporal sensitivity on the y-axis there to mean annual precipitation across multiple sites. And as you can see, this temporal sensitivity decreases as mean annual precipitation increases. Or in general, drier regions are expected to be far more sensitive to temporal variability and precipitation than wet regions. However, there's two things I'd like you to notice about this graph. One is that there's only about 14 data points driving this relationship in total. And the second is what do these data points actually represent? And if we start at the driest region there, that data point reflects the sensitivity of a desert ecosystem with distinct vegetation within that system. And if we go across that gradient, maybe in the middle, we'll see a prairie with distinct communities within that ecosystem. And if we go into the most immediate music point, the most music region, we get a deciduous forest. So these points represent uh, significantly different vegetation types. And as a consequence, this relationship that we've seen may simply reflect differences in sensitivity that arise due to differences in vegetation structure. However, this has not been tested to date. And this informs the two general questions of this talk. The first is, how do patterns of temporal sensitivity vary across space in general? And the second is, how does the space-time interaction vary within different vegetation types? So previous patterns reflect differences across vegetation types, but to date, we have not been able to test how this pattern uh, may look within distinct vegetation types, just simply due to uh, limitations in how extensive our data sets are with that plot level clipping. So to answer this question, I utilize the Western United States dryland region. And this region is a great uh, natural laboratory because we see distinct vegetation types that dominate throughout this region. And all these, all these vegetation types are water limited systems. And we get a diverse set of different vegetation structures that range from the California annuals to shrub dominated cold deserts to hot deserts to the short grass steppe to northern mixed grass prairies. However, if we want to see how these patterns compare within vegetation types, we need extensive data sets. And today we haven't had that with this plot level clipping data. So to answer this question, we can turn to the tools of remote sensing. And for this talk in particular, I'm going to describe data from the Landsat satellite mission from 1986 to 2015. And in particular, I'm using a recently updated product of that from Nate Robinson and colleagues where they optimize the gross primary productivity component of the, uh, the model utilized to generate the net primary productivity data. And they did that for the continental United States. And if, as a first step, what this can allow us to do is understand spatial variability and net primary producti productivity. So this 
map here represents mean spatial variability and net primary productivity across the different dry land regions. And we can link that with modeled estimates of mean annual precipitation. And what we can do to start is we can go into space and we can extract data from a single pickle, pixel, excuse me, from the uh, <laughs> Southern California annual region. And in the same way we did this for the plot level data, we can get a time series of net primary productivity data. And we can link that with the annual precipitation data to get an understanding of how sensitive net primary productivity is to temporal variation and precipitation in that particular location. And what that does is we can map that on to a pixel that exists in space. And we can begin to compare how that relationship may differ across different vegetation types, such as the cold deserts. And if we do this a thousand times, or however many pixels there are, tens of thousands, what we get is an understanding of spatial variability in dry land sensitivity to temporal variability in precipitation. And what I want to show here is now the raw data. I want to plot it on a bivariate plot. And so each one of those points reflects the data from all the pixels. So each, so a data point there represents data from a pixel. Where on the y-axis we have sensitivity, and on the x-axis we have mean annual precipitation. And we can begin to decompose this, all these data into vegetation types. And on the corner there I have the previous across vegetation uh, data. And so in the California annual systems we see what we may expect, that decreasing function. And we can begin to introduce noise and variability here, the short grass steppe, and the hot deserts, the northern mixed grass prairies, and the cold deserts. And just to simplify this, we can uh, linearize these relationships. And we can see that there's substantial variation in the sensitivity mean annual precipitation relationships according to vegetation types, whereas we see that negative relationship we would expect across vegetation types for the California annuals, as well as the short grass steppe. Uh, this relationship is very weak in the northern mixed grass prairies. Um, however, it shif shifts towards positive in the hot deserts region, which is opposite of what we would predict based off patterns observed across vegetation types. And because this is very pattern oriented, I want to speculate a little bit on the mechanisms that could be driving this. So if we look to the hot deserts, what may be driving this increase in sensitivity to precipitation as mean annual precipitation gets or increases? So I would suggest that in the driest regions of the hot deserts, arguably the most water limited region in the Western US, there's substantial bare ground space, uh, which necessarily makes those regions limited by meristematic or leaf area densi densities, placing a vegetation constraint on how productivity can respond in these regions. And the density of vegetation may very well simply increase as regions generally get wetter on average, and therefore they have a higher capacity to respond to, uh, say, a surplus or an extremely wet year. Whereas if we go to the California annual grasslands, uh, we, get, we may see more typically what is predicted to, to happen uh, with that negative relationship, where, which suggests that in dry regions, uh, they may simply, water may simply be the most limiting resource in those regions. But as you go from, as you increase the amount of precipitation and regions get wetter, you may get a resource coal limitation dynamic where light or soil nutrients are more important to driving productivity. And that could decouple those regions, productivity in those regions from responding to variation in precipitation. And just two short conclusions. Uh, so we have this previous pattern here that's based off differences across vegetation types. But this pattern 
likely vary substantially within regions that are characterized by a single dominant vegetation type. And with respect to climate change, we're expecting to see uh, precipitation changes both in mean precipitation as well as variability in precipitation. And as a consequence of this role of vegetation in driving these patterns, predicting the response of an ecosystem at any one place at any one time requires consideration of what the dominant vegetation structure is within that region. And just to go over some future work, uh, what I've shown you is kind of the tip of the iceberg here. And what we're doing now is building a more robust statistical model to predict productivity in space and time by incorporating the independent and interactive effects of mean annual precipitation, vegetation, and variability in precipitation in our statistical model utilizing all this data we have. And to be a little more mechanistic about this, the next step is to use modeled estimates of soil moisture instead of precipitation to see if these patterns hold up when we use an arguably more mechanistic variable. And I'm also interested in the role of vegetation life histories in driving these patterns, say a bet hedger or a conservative life history uh, that doesn't respond much to precipitation or resource flu fluctuations through time may respond very differently than a vegetation structure characterized by a very plastic life history strategy. Uh, so to answer that question, I'm util utilizing population models. And I'll stop there, and thank you for your time.